You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Ayam Namazi. And I'm Farid Bourspuya. In this week's program, we'll interview Walid al Husseini, Palestinian atheist. We'll also be talking about a renewed bounty against the writer Salman Rushdie, protests in Iran against animal cruelty, refugees in Germany now having to give up their valuables and property, as well as a village in Sistan Balichestan where the entire male population has been executed. We'll also talk about an insane fatwa against neckties and a wonderful song by a woman when she throws off her burqa at a singing competition to sing against violence against women. Don't go away. In the week that passed, there are several news items that we'd like to talk to you about. One, of course, is the increased bounty uh, to promote the death fatwa against Salman Rushdie, the writer for his book, Satanic Verses. And, of course, it was the 27th anniversary, Valentine's Day, a day of love. And, of course, they just promote more hate. And, uh, you know, it, it's interesting how a regime in Iran, all the way over there can incite hatred and murder against someone who is a citizen of another country. It's astonishing. I, it, it's just amazing that the silence of the government yes. is just uh, it's astonishing. Um, at the same time, this is a good example of um, promotion of extremism, uh, promotion of Islamism uh, across the world, and people need to react to this, and this is where we need to draw the line. Yeah, definitely. There's a statement issued by uh, many campaigners. Uh, we've signed on to it, as well as people like Richard Dawkins, the scientist, Peter Tatchell, the human rights campaigner, Maria Mahela Lucas, the founder of Secularism is a Women's Issue, stating that this has to be condemned and that Salman Rushdie needs to be defended, the fatwa needs to be cancelled, but also the many writers and free thinkers in Iran need to be defended as well. And of course, you know, Salman Rushdie is the tip of the iceberg. We, we've heard news recently of an in, a village in Sistan, Baluchistan, where the entire male population has been executed by this regime. And this is the type of uh, government we are uh, supposed to dealing with and people are sort of arguing that they are uh, stepping closer towards reformism and and the free world and free this is all nonsense the Islamic regime is not change will not change um, it may retreat under pressure but pr we have to put and uh, apply the pressure yeah. that's the important thing. yeah we definitely have to apply yeah. the pressure and of course uh, you know even animals in Iran have a very very difficult time there are no laws protecting animals in Iran uh, in many places dogs are considered haram and dirty uh, to be you know to be touched by those who yeah. pray and uh, recently there was a video wasn't there last week there was a video um, showing that a uh, man um, abusing a dog, hitting and pulling and kicking and, you know, beating the dog to the, you know, in, in a really horrific uh, sort of scenes that was uh, went on social media. And what was good is that the video became viral and there were protests in Iran against it. And we'll try and show you a clip of that protest because yeah, it just shows that even though uh, the government had said no protests were allowed prior to the so-called elections. Nonetheless, people went out to defend animal rights. Uh, yeah, a lot of people um, actually gathered in front of the uh, environmental agency organization uh, or organization in, in, in Tehran, and hundreds of people were there with the open book banner in support and in defense of the animal um, and against animal cruelty in Iran. And actually, because there is no law in Iran uh, uh, defending the um, animal and or against animal cruelty, people are demanding that from the government. And immediately the government responded to this 
and the, um, the very quickly they were able to arrest the person who committed this crime and they have jailed the person. But that shows the level of strength that people have in defence of the animals in Iran. And of course the final news is the news on the fact that uh, Bavaria in Germany has now decided to follow up with uh, what Denmark has done and to confiscate the property, personal property and even personal jewellery of refugees coming into the country to pay for their accommodation and, and such and such. And it does remind one of what happened to Jews in Nazi Germany. It is chilling to hear that this can happen to people who have fled with barely anything but the you know basic because when you're fleeing you can't take your kitchen sink. You take the things that are most dear to you. Uh, and to think that that's going to be confiscated is disgusting to say the least. Yeah, and at, at the same time um, apart from the heartache of this policy. The reality is that anything that happens to the most vulnerable section of a society, in this case the refugees, the governments will usually apply to the rest of the society. Any law applying, for example, reducing the benefits of the asylum seekers would happen later on to the most vulnerable section of the other sections of the society. So people need to take note of this. This is the plan for the rest of a society. To defend your rights, you have to defend refugees and the rights now. Last week, whilst I was at the European Parliament giving a speech on confronting Islamism and defending secularism, I met my good friend Walid al Husseini there. He is a wonderful Palestinian atheist who is active in France right now. He started the Council of Ex-Muslims of France and he's just written a book called Blasphemer. Stay with us and watch this very interesting interview with him. Walid al-Husseini, it's a lovely pleasure to interview you. Um, I wanted to just um, talk first about this brilliant book you've written, it's in French. Uh, tell us a bit about what the book's about because I've been hearing so much about it but I haven't, had to, I haven't been able to read it because it's in French. Yeah, uh, the book is about, uh, it's about what happened to me, if, if, it's, uh, it's like from me, if, uh, from the childhood still living Islam and what happened uh, with me there. It's more, it's more about the period of, uh, of jail when I was arrested and then I left from France. So it's kind of a biography, uh, but focus more about the time when I was in jail and left till France and asking for the, and I got the political refugee here in France. That's all about, and some of my ideas about Islam. So tell us uh, the bit about, because it's about you being uh, jailed in the Palestinian authorities. Yes. What are some of the things that um, you wrote about in the book? That yeah, the, uh, in the book, about yes, I, I talk about, even I describe in, inside the book about the Palestinian society in general, like because you know, most of the people who are out of Palestine, they are just know about the conflict between Palestine and Israel. Nobody knowing about, for example, the situation of uh, of, uh, of ex-Muslims or of, of atheism, the situation even of women, because even the situation of women, like last time when we were, uh, was in the conference of women, they just speaking about Israel, and they, uh, everything they saying it's about because of Israel or of of something like this. I didn't say Israel is perfect or something, but not everything. Israel didn't say till the. For, uh, they didn't tell Palestinian for the honor crime, for example, they did, uh, about how to treat women. All these things I was explaining in, in some of, uh, inside my book about the Palestinian society, like what exactly is it? And uh, for you, I mean, uh, with um, the, the whole idea of criticizing Islam, obviously yeah. you were imprisoned for it. Uh, what sort of uh, reaction did you get from people there in the Palestinian territories? In the beginning there when I was uh, criticized, first, you know, why I, I went, uh, is the, the question why I, wa I was using internet or, uh, or social media. It was because 
when I would try to speak in around me in university, nobody accepted me and it was ha having some problems, uh, some problem for me. So for I went to the to using internet just to be to become and it's, uh, till now it's the only place for us to speak about uh, to speak about atheism. Even some of them they speak, uh, using fake names. For, they don't put pictures. They just wanted to be to be uh, to be themselves. That's why when I uh, I I, try, uh, I was uh, going uh, in the internet and was be myself as uh, I speak about what I think and and criticize. For me, if I want to talk about Islam, it's for me it's like all religion. They are the situation of women, the situation of freedom of. Uh, uh, freedom of uh, human, the compatible, uh, compatible with uh, human rights or something. Uh, all these things. That's why I I left Islam. I and I was I was discussing that, and even till now that when you discussing these things, some people don't have, uh, still have discussion about that. What do you think about uh, you know the fact that, for example, recently there's uh, been this campaign where a lot of um, atheist Facebook pages have been removed by uh, Facebook, yeah. for example, and there's constant pressure, even on social media, yes. that atheist face. Yeah, this is, you know, this, even, uh, even with these things, what ha uh, I think it's, uh, I, what I blame, I blame Facebook, because for me, uh, Muslims, I know Muslims, uh, when they have, uh, the, when they could do something against the other, like us, I mean, for the ex-Muslim, or they did, for example, Daesh kill uh, da uh, Islamic State. They killed because they could kill uh, the people who are in the so uh, social uh, network. They are did uh, they they want uh, what they do? They do killing. But uh, okay, it's uh, it's uh, virtual killing, but it's killing because everything is killing. So there is no different for me. Both are the same. This man, who, uh, this one, who are uh, reporting you you in fa Facebook and wanted to close. The one, the only place you can explain yourself, he's doing the same what uh, like the Islamic State doing. So, uh, but that's why when I uh, blame, I blame Facebook. He should, he should change the uh, the privacy of things and how to look because when he got a lot of uh, report, he didn't look what the uh, what the what they have uh, if it's true or something. He, that's what he should. I mean, what I blame, I blame Facebook because for me, Muslims. Because the thing is, like you say, social media is one of the only things that people have. It's the only one. Yeah, so it's so important for it to be free for ex Muslims and Indians. Yes, that's why, that's why. Now uh, they are back today. But, I, but even uh, maybe this is a group, sometimes they uh, report uh, the profiles because all, all of them, they, do some, uh, they don't use. Real name because if you, they use your re, uh, real name, they will be be killed. And when they, when the Muslim report the uh, these accounts, they report them with fake names or fake picture, and they good delete. And it's also should be protected. So uh, I mean, a lot of people are talking about very large numbers of atheists in the Arab world. Middle East, North Africa. I mean, I'm sure you get a lot of contacts from people. Yeah. What, what sense do you get about what's happening? Yeah, they are uh, raising. For I, uh, last time I said for some uh, in Arabic, uh, I was in the Arabic channel and I said I can tell you that in every home in Arabic world there is one at, uh, one atheist or one, one uh, non-believer. He was shocked, but I mean, okay, I know it's. it's uh, it's it's possible because there is many people who are, but and you know why they didn't, uh, we, uh, why we didn't have real numbers and why we can't uh, uh, know because of, because of the what happening. I mean, you can't be, you can't say that you are athe or ex-Muslim or even you left Islam in in Arabic or Muslim world, so that you you will not have numbers at all. But uh, uh, there is much uh, even. Now, with I, I, I'm, uh, some people they saying that it's because of fundamentalism, it's become more ati. I don't agree with this point because if if if, if with fundamentals it's, it will be reaction or uh, something else. But most of the people 
what what happening it when they say the fundamentalism they ask is that islam and then they discover it's the islam <laughs> so it's also it is fundamentalism then no <laughs> no because they realize that fundamentalism is uh, islam because they islam. yes because they didn't know because what the, what we uh, from the beginning we know about islam it's like i mean uh, what the uh, some imam said it's like religion of peace, love, they make everything. That's what they did. But so when they read Islam really, they become. Because there's two ways. If you understand the Quran, you, show, you become ethic or you become fundamental. And it's dependent on you, nothing else. Finally, uh, what are you trying to achieve with the book you wrote, with the Council of Ex-Muslims of uh, France that you've established? What's your goal? What do we go? We, uh, uh, yeah, yes. I understand. Work. We are, we are, voice of people who are there who they could, they couldn't speak. But you know, in France, even we we should we should stand up for laicity because even in France, laicity is going back, not going further, forward, and this is this is a big problem. And that's it. Uh, Thank you. You are welcome. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed uh, that interview with Walid al Hosseini. I think he raises some really important points. And one, of course, is the fact that there is not one family in the Arab world, and I would say also in a place like Iran, that doesn't have an atheist. Yes, it's true. And I think that's why atheism is seen to be so dangerous. The Saudi government, for example, has equated it with terrorism. They are afraid of atheism because there are so many atheists. And uh, more and more, I think, uh, people are uh, recognizing that they are part of a movement and um, speaking openly about the atheism. Um, you have to bear in mind that apostasy in the Islamic rhythm societies is um, effectively punishable by death. So to uh, declare your atheism, not just not believing atheism spe specifically, it, you need to be very brave. And I think that's gathering momentum. But there are a lot of atheists, there are a lot of free thinkers um, in Middle East and, um, and Islamic rhythm societies, um, but they are actually now openly yeah. coming and declaring their and, allegiance. And he did, Walid al Husseini did talk about you know social media and its importance in facilitating that. We've been talking about that on this program as well. And of course, one of the things we know is that Facebook has been shutting down uh, many of the Arab atheists' Facebook pages due to harassment campaigns and complaints, mass complaints often organized by Islamists. And as he says, you know, Facebook is shutting down basically one of the only avenues that are available for atheists to speak. So stop doing that, Facebook. Stop it now. The insane, 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 insane fatwa of this week is from someone who has a very, very long name. Have you noticed the correlation between stupid, stupid, stupid fatwa and very, very long name? And his name is the Mufti Azam Hind Alama Akhtar Raza Khan Azhari of Darga Ala Hazrat in Bareilly in Uttar Pradesh, India. And he's issued a fatwa against obviously something that needs many fatwas against it, the necktie. Because it, the necktie looks like a cross. Imagine, hmm. this is, this, these are crazy people, man. <laughs> Imagine you're driving a car hmm. and you approach a junction. Yeah. You can't, you have to reverse, reverse. and go back. <laughs> <laughs> you're walking in the woods, you see a tree. It looks like a cross. Cut Don't it go down. there. No, cut it down <laughs> immediately. These are crazy people. I mean, what else can we say about it? It's just, you know, a necktie. It's a necktie. A necktie. The slice of life this week is of a Afghan woman singing at a uh, singing competition similar to Idol, 
where she comes on stage with a borga and removes it and sings a song against stoning and violence against women. It is a beautiful thing to see. And just it's just at the same time you'll see, uh, you know, reaction of the whole audience. Everybody stands and uh, you know clap for her like, like crazy. And this is a beautiful moment in a country that um, is dominated by a very strong Islamist group. But the majority of people, time and again, show that they're actually sick and tired of the Islamists. And the beauty of this moment actually shows the past beauty of Afghanistan and present and for the and future. future. And of course, one of the things you were saying earlier is how much must people scream? How much must people scream for their rights, for their freedoms, for dignity until they're heard. Uh, honestly, it just, you know, how, what, what more can people do to say that they want a different sort of life? Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this week's program. We look forward to hearing from you. Please continue to send us your comments and your questions. We look forward to seeing you, of course, again at the same time and same place next week. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.